Welcome back to Fast Market here on the Schwab Network. It's time for our cash tag segment. For that, let's bring in Andy Swan. He's a co-founder at Likefolio. Welcome back to the show, Andy. Thank you. All right, so we're talking DoorDash. The stock's up 110% over the last 12 months. Uh, you know, Andy, I, I, I think about this stock in a lot of different ways because they still lose money on a quarterly basis on EPS. But at the same time, they're following that path that Uber did really well. And we talked about Uber with you guys earlier this week. That, that movement to free cash flow really has investors excited. We've, that's why we've seen the stock rally. Uh, do you guys have data that backs up this move that we've seen? Yeah, I'd say we have, you know, data that, that conflicts all over the place. You know, I think the story of DoorDash is a story of conflict, at least in terms of how people view the stock. It's, you know, you it's kind of like a road start. Rosarch test, I think that's how you say it, where you can kind of see what you want when you look at this company. You can see a company that's losing money. You can see a company that loses more money the more business it does. You can also see a company that's gaining market share that is in a uh, niche that is expanding. There's a lot that goes into this company, and I think it's going to be a battle for the next two or three years between bulls and bears before we finally figure out exactly what's going on. But from a like folio data perspective, you know, we do see DoorDash as uh, one of those companies that uh, it gets more mentions over time, so more and more people talking about using it, but also has a very low but stable happiness rating. So consumers kind of love to hate using this service. They love to complain about it when it's wrong, but they kind of can't get out of their own way in terms of actually uh, using it. It, you know, you could go so far as to say people are fairly addicted to using DoorDash and to having meals delivered to them very, uh, very easily, but not very cheaply. And so the biggest complaints about DoorDash are related to the fees and the increasing cost of food, which, uh, you know, if we look at McDonald's, it's raised prices by double uh, over the last decade or so. Um, you know, the Subway $5 foot long is now a $6 six inch. You know, this is happening everywhere, so DoorDash is not immune to these complaints. Um, overall, we think that the DoorDash consumer base is very, very sticky. Uh, we see uh, that consumer base starting to grow, but more importantly, we're starting to see indications that their base of users is using the service more and more often, which, um, you know, if they can get their, uh, you know, their expenses in line, that will certainly help because they're they're not they don't need new customers nearly as badly as they used to, which means less marketing costs because they're getting more and more out of each user that they do have, which is always a positive sign for for a company like this. You know, Andy, I thought Tom's point on this was really uh, strong. Like, if, if, are all the doubts we have about this company going to do the same thing that Uber did, just melt right. away with all of a sudden earnings and free cash flow? My other question is this. They've got about 65% market share. Uber Eats has about 23, Grubhub about 9. But the investment that these companies have put into these supply chains or, you know, and all the investment, do they have a moat around two or maybe three of these companies that, that there's no other company going to be able to do this anytime soon? So it's these three, pick your winner and go with it. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, one of the last things I would want to do as an entrepreneur right now is start a ride sharing service or a food delivery service. I mean, you're going up against you know, what are now very established players with extremely competent networks of drivers and logistics technology that would be nearly impossible to replicate in time to compete with them. So I do think that there's a significant moat. In fact, I think, uh, you know, this could turn out to be a winner takes most type of category. I could see this being, you know, 70% or 65% DoorDash, 25% Uber Eats within the next few years. And I think that's probably uh, where things are headed. And that's what DoorDash uh, wants. They, you know, they want to dominate this niche because this niche is expanding and has a significant tailwind. Yeah, uh, I was looking at that consumer uh, happiness levels for DoorDash versus, you know, Uber Eats, Instacart and Walmart delivery. 
Uh, it seems really low, uh, Andy, and this one seems like one of those inflationary questions to you, kind of, is the fact yeah. that it's low because, you know, people are getting stung by just ordering fast food itself now. It seems like, you know, uh, a, a $5 meal at McDonald's is now 15 bucks. At some yeah. point, it's just going to snap the back of, uh, you know, this consumer, right, isn't it, if it, if it keeps up this way? Yeah, it certainly feels like it. And I think, um, you know, the the other point is, um, you know, it used to be people complaining that their order was wrong or their order was late or something that DoorDash itself did wrong. Now, most of those complaints that make up the 56% unhappy are people that are referring to the vendor, so the McDonald's or the Pizza Hut or whatever it is that they got the food from, or in most cases, inflation, just like you mentioned. You know, that's the primary driver of complaints. And so we take the consumer happiness levels being low uh, with a little bit of a grain of salt when it comes to both Uber Eats and DoorDash. We'd love to see DoorDash catch up to Uber Eats and get above that 50% happiness level. But uh, both of them being where they are, it's kind of like airlines. At some point, you just accept the fact that it, you know, most of your customers that you actually hear from are going to be the unhappy ones. Yeah, uh, definitely uh, about airlines on that. Now, Andy, they don't have earnings till the 1st of May. Uh, if you guys had an earnings score today, uh, what would it be? Yeah, our earnings score right now would be fairly neutral. I'm really looking, I'm really hoping for a significant move pre-earnings that we can fade. Uh, you know, we think the stock is priced about right. We think analysts have settled into understanding the company. And so we'd love to see a significant move in one direction or the other going into earnings so that we can play the other way and, and see if we can't get this right back to where it is today. All right. Great stuff. Great data. As always, Andy, appreciate it. Thank you. All right. That's Andy Swan, co-founder at Lifefolio, breaking down the data. Kevin, I did want to make that point. Free